Hello, family and friends. Welcome back to Bible study. My name is Kanoi. We are on day 200 of reading and studying through the Bible in just one year on track on time and I am so excited for what God is going to reveal to us. Today we are talking about restoration and this is one that I hold near and dear to my heart and I love it because it really displays God's heart and His love and His grace and mercy and we talk about that so much and really getting a good grasp on that is so important in our lives because that is what fuels us to continue throughout this lifetime. Now if you are an OG, if you've been here for a while, if you could help us out by by liking this video and of course making sure you're subscribed to the channel, hitting the notification bell, joining our Facebook group, doing all of the things that will help our entire group out. This is going to not only help us personally grow, but also is going to help get these videos out all across the world so that we can build the kingdom together. And that's what we're doing. We are being obedient to God and we're doing it together. So we thank you, Lord, for this day, another day to wake up, to have breath in our lungs. We are so thankful for who you are, first of all, and what you have done for us. God, we don't come to serve you because of what we can get. We don't feel like we deserve anything from you like you owe us something, God. We come here because you are worthy of it. We come here because we want to honor you and we want to bless you because you are that good. And so I just pray that in this time we will do that, that our hearts will be postured in such a way that blesses you, Lord. And if there is something, God, that is keeping us from being able to experience you in the fullness of it, I pray, Lord, that you will reveal it to us now, that you will open up our ears to hear your voice, our eyes to be able to read your word and to really truly understand it and get a good grasp on it. We ask for wisdom today and an increase in our discernment and an increase in our faith as well. Please forgive us of our sins, Lord, and I ask that you will help us to turn from them, to never go back, but to repent and to only walk with you and to continue toward you as we make our way into eternity throughout this journey of life, this short period that we have here on this earth. So give us that eternal perspective today, Lord, because sometimes it can feel real long down here through the turmoil, through the trials, through the tribulations. So help us to realize, Lord, it is but a breath that eternity awaits and that as long as we are faithful and as long as we are seeking you diligently, Lord, you will reward that. So thank you for this time. Bless your people, Lord. Meet them where they're at. You know exactly what they need in this time. You know their prayers even before they speak them. So I pray, God, that you will let them know that your ears are turned toward them. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we're in 2 Kings chapter 18, looking at the reign of Hezekiah in Judah. Hezekiah was one of the best kings that came out of Judah ever since David. He was the best king since David. And he is the son of Ahaz, who was one of the most wicked kings. So it's interesting to see the contrast between the two. So his name means the Lord has strengthened, and this is happening around 729 BC, about the time that he is reigning with his father, King Ahaz, he had a co-regency with him. So in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. So this is showing that he had a blessed reign. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Number one, most important thing, like David, he did what was right. His eyes and his hearts were turned toward God, according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherah, which many of the kings had not done before that. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it, and it was called Nehushtan. Now this is an example of when a good thing can turn sour, when a godly thing can then become an idol. Because if you remember the story about the brass serpent, it was erected so that the people could look to it and be healed, very similar to the way that we look to the cross and we are healed. It was never intended by Moses to actually be an idol and to be worshiped. But all throughout these years, the people have turned to idolatry in such a way that they are now offering sacrifices unto this bronze serpent. It is often said that we will become like that which we worship. So we get to make a choice here. Are we going to worship God and all of his characteristics, all of the wonderful things about him and become more like him? Or are we going to choose the death, 
the dumb and the lame things of the world and become more like that. And we have to bring into remembrance what an idol, a modern day idol can look like. Because many of us could turn a blind eye to it and say, I'm not worshiping any statues or I'm not bringing sacrifices to anything here on this earth. That's not what a modern day idol is. Modern day idol is anything that you end up worshiping or giving more of yourself to over God. That can be our past where we get stuck in what once was and are having a hard time moving forward. It can be our job, anything that we're striving for on the daily. It can be success. It can be people, procedures, practices, even ministry can become an idol. So let's do a heart check here. Is there anything in your life that was once seen as good, that was godly, that has potentially become an idol in your life? Verse 5, and he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was none like him among all the kings of Judah after him, nor among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him wherever he went out, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He struck down the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. So he refuses to be a vassal state to any other nation. He's like, we are going to claim back our independence and we will not be under the rule of anyone else but the Lord. In the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of the three years, he took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and put them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of Medes, because they did not obey the voice of their Lord, the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant, even all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. They neither listened nor obeyed. Obeyed. So they are seeing the judgment upon Israel as prophesied as Assyria comes in and starts to disperse the people all throughout the land. Now, in the 14th year, this is now when he is ruling on his own, no longer in a co-regency with his father, of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all of the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I've done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. So he's like, if you want to give me back those taxes, I'll pay them. And the king of Assyria required of Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king ha king's house. So Hezekiah is having a lapse in judgment here, a little bit of a lack of faith, and he is feeding the enemy. We can't feed the enemy because the thing is, is he's always going to come back and want more. It'll never be enough. If you say, you know, I'm just going to scratch that itch a little bit. I'm just going to do it this one time. It'll never be just one time. So don't feed the enemy because when you do, he only gets fatter. Now we've got two spirits warring within us, our flesh and the spirit of God. We got to look at those as two wolves. Are we going to feed the wolf of the enemy of the flesh or are we going to feed the wolf of the spirit of God? Which one are you going to allow to get fatter in your life? So he is taking from the king's house to feed him and only wetting his appetite. And at that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord, now taking from the temple as well, and from the doorpost that Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshakeh with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the washer's field. So again, these details are for us to see this is a very real place, a very real situation. And when they called for the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. So they are basically now trying to intimidate them to surrender. 
and they're going to use a lot of psychological warfare, which is a huge tactic of the enemy. He did it with Adam and Eve. He tried to do it with Jesus in the wilderness. Didn't work with him. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? Do you really think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? So he is like, hello, you're trying to come against the greatest enemy of your life? Behold, you are trusting now in Egypt that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and the altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now and make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. So look what he's doing. He is mistakenly think, thinking that Hezekiah took down the sanctified altar. So he's like, you know, is it not those high places that he is trying to tell you you shall worship the God? He took those down. What's going on? But Hezekiah didn't take down the altars of the Lord. He only took down the high places that were of the pagans. And he was trying to say, God's not going to help you. Your altars are gone. Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Notice that he is trying to say that God spoke to him, which is very unlikely. So when someone says, the Lord said to me, that does not necessarily mean that it is true. This is why we always have to be steadfast in reading the word, knowing what it says, and taking what someone else says and comparing it to the word and making sure that one, they're speaking truth, but two, your discernment now with the Holy Spirit within you has to be heightened because they could still speak truth of the word, but it could potentially not be applicable to your life in that moment. So doesn't necessarily mean that it is truly from God. And the thing is, is that they may have actually been aware of the prophecy that was spoken over them. So they're trying to use it to their advantage. Well, didn't God say, you know, the Lord told me that this is what's going to happen. But it is highly unlikely that the Lord actually spoke to him and said these things. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna and Joah said to Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we do understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. So Aramaic was the international language that they would use in diplomatic conversations. So they did not want their own people hearing the words that they were speaking of the native tongue, but they're speaking in their native tongue to try to intimidate them even more. And so if they were able to intimidate the people, then that was ultimately going to demoralize them. It would make them lose confidence. And then they would potentially turn to them for strength and not to the Lord anymore. So Aramaic was kind of like the English language, you know, that they speak at these kind of diplomatic conferences or at the UN or whatever it may be. But the language of Judah within the hearing of the people are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine? So he is trying. I mean, just, just the fact that he said that, he wanted them to hear that they are about to be destroyed. And that was the whole purpose. That's why they were doing it. So... This was all in the plan. You know, they're not trying to sit here and build relationships. Then Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. So they're basically saying, praise the enemy. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. So he's saying, I am more powerful than you. So you need to doubt your leader. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying the Lord will surely deliver us and the city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. So here he's telling them, I need you to also not only doubt your leader, but you need to doubt your God as well. Make your peace with me. So surrender to me. 
so of the enemy, right? And come out to meet. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine and each one of his own fig tree and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern. So he is now promising them that they are going to have prosperity. They're saying you're going to have your own vine, your own land, your own well. So not only is he promising prosperity, but also protection. He says, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey, that you may live and not die. And do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying, the Lord will deliver us, because he knows that that's exactly what Hezekiah is going to say. Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Well, probably not, because the pagan gods were not strong enough to actually deliver a people, but we know that God Almighty is. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the lands have delivered their lands out of my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand. So he is trying to make them doubt. That's exactly what the devil will do. The enemy will always try to make His plans look better and your plans look terrible. Now, what I find interesting here is that he really could have just come in and started slaying people, but he didn't want to fight them because he wanted to disarm them. That is what the enemy tries to do with us. He knows that he cannot win a fight against us when we have the spirit of God and the word of God deep down into our souls and into our spirits. He'll never win against God Almighty within us. And he knows that. So he's not going to try to fight you. What he's going to try to do is take your weapons away. He is going to do this by trying to intimidate you, by trying to show you something else so that you will turn your back on God. If he can discourage you to the point of demoralization and insecurity, then he knows that you will now start to doubt your faith and you will start to doubt God. And then he won't have to do anything. You will end up giving up and taking your own self down. Whereas on the flip side of that, if he tries to pull battle with you, he knows that it's actually probably going to push you closer to the Lord and it's only going to equip you even more. So he's not going to fight. He will always try to de-weaponize you first. So if you are feeling attacked and you're starting to feel like you're losing confidence, you're feeling insecure, start heading to the Lord. Get on your knees, start praying, get back into the word. Do not let him disarm you. And the people here, extremely wise, but the people were silent. They held their peace and answered him not a word. For the king's command was do not answer him. So the king, thankfully, was wise here before he fed the enemy. This time he is saying, do not answer him. Do not feed him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of Rabshakeh. So we need to be people who are always keeping the Lord between us and the enemy. He will give us the right words. He will give us the direction in which to go. He will tell us when to be silent, but we've got to make sure that he is in front of us. Second Chronicles 29, and we're seeing Hezekiah's reign once again with a few extra additions. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His name was Abijah, so same person, uh, shortened name when we saw it in 2 Kings, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord according to all that David his father had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites. Now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. So step number one, when it comes to our own restoration, because that is exactly what Hezekiah is doing. He is restoring the temple, restoring the nation, is we have got to open our doors. We've got to simply be willing to allow for this spiritual transformation. Are your doors open? The Lord says, those who seek me early shall find me. That's the very first thing. He's like, you know what? We're going to 
enter into this reign with guns blazing. We're going to get things right. So early on, he was like, we got to repair the temple here. And that's oftentimes what we've got to do. Our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when there's going to be restoration, there's going to be some cleaning up to do. And that's exactly what's happening here. The second thing he told him, he said, you've got to clean up your act. You have got to clean out the filth. Otherwise, in the spiritual sense, that means you've got to confess of your sin. You've got to find out what's filthy within you and confess of it. So open your doors and then confess of your sin or clean up your act. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. This was the reason for all of their problems. They had forsaken God and they had turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of horror, of astonishment, of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. Now, this whole cleaning process, not only for the temple, but also for us, is going to be a continual thing. It's not a one-time event where you clean your house and then you're good for the rest of the your life or even for the rest of the year. When we clean our houses, we've got to mop, you know, several times a week. We've got to vacuum our home. We've got to dust the things. We've all got chores to do. It's a continual thing because we get dirty again. The filth comes back into our minds. So this is going to be a process that is for the rest of our lives. Just want to put that out there real quick before we continue. So let's do a heart check though before we go into the second half of restoring our temple. When is the last time that you have actually done a deep cleaning in your own spiritual temple? For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn from us. My sons, Do not now be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to be his ministers and make offerings to him. This is such an honor for them. You've been chosen. So he is essentially telling them, you guys got to get your focus back on the right place. You may have blurred vision for a little while, but we are bringing you back to what once was. You've been chosen and you need to focus on that. Focus on your calling. This is our central purpose. What has God called you to do? Well, our general calling is to make disciples of nations, to get out there and preach the word of God, to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. That's our central purpose. And we too are chosen. We can lose focus sometimes, but we just have to come back to the fact that we've been chosen and repent, turning back to God. If you have turned your back and done things that you are now confessing of, well, the next step is to repent of that about face and face God. Focus on your calling and knowing that you have been chosen by him for such a time as this. What an honor, right? Then the Levites arose, so they did it. They are responding. Mahath, the son of Amasai, and Joel, the son of Azariah, of the sons of the Kohathites, and of the sons of Merari, Kish, the son of Abdi, and Azariah, the son of Jehalalel, and of the Gershonites, Joah, the son of Zimah, and Eden, the son of Zoah, the sons of Elizaphan, Shimri, and Joel, and the sons of Asaph, Asaph, Zechariah, and Mataniah, and of the sons of Heman, Jehuel, and Shimei. And of the sons of Jeduthun, Shimea, and Uziel, they gathered their brothers and consecrated themselves and went in as the king had commanded by the word. So this is showing this is divine authority that has been spoken in how to do this. By the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. The priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it and carried it out to the brook Kidron. They began to consecrate on the first day of the first month, and on the eighth day of the month they came to the vegetable of the Lord. Then, for eight days, they consecrated the house of the Lord, and on the sixteenth day, on the first month, they finished. So they spent eight days on the inner part of the temple and eight days in the outer courts. A lot of the times when we start to do a cleaning process on the inner parts of our temple, a spiritual transformation, it will show itself on the outer 
courts, on our outward appearance. We will physically look different when we clean up our act. Some people may not know exactly what it is. They might start to ask you, did you do something? Did you get a haircut? Have you lost weight? You know, did something change? You seem happier. Things will physically look different whenever you do an interior cleaning in your spirit. Then they went to Hezekiah the king and said, We've cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils, and the table for the showbread and all its utensils. All the utensils that King Ahaz discarded in his reign when he was faithless, we have made ready and consecrated, and behold, they are here before the altar of the Lord. So after cleaning out everything that was dirty and getting rid of all the junk, they brought back in all of the holy things. So even when we cleanse ourselves, there's a next step step, and I didn't write it here, which I should have, is bringing back the holy things, refilling now with the holiness of God. So when we empty, now we get into the word. We get into the word and we start uh, polishing our gifts or our instruments, which is what comes next. So I wrote here, get into the word, but I forgot to write, um, fill yourself. Let's see, bring back the holy things. I'm going to write that right here. Bring back the holy things. So if you have this in your notes, make sure you add in 4.5. <laughs> I can't add another number, so we're going have these. All right. Then Hezekiah the king rose early. So this is showing his zeal. And I wanted to do a heart check because I think, you know, I, I get that people's Schedules are different, so I'm not talking about the hours of the day. I'm just saying when your day starts, are you zealous to the point where you rise early to meet the Lord? This could be midnight for you if you are a person who works the graveyard shift. So it's when your day starts, do you rise early? Do you have that zeal? Now, I don't want to discourage anybody because this is kind of one of those above and beyond kind of things, a little bit of extra. It comes with the territory of seeking God. Your desire to seek Him early will be evidence of the fact that you are drawing nearer to him. It's kind of one of those things. It just kind of comes with the territory. And also rising early and zeal can mean, do you seek him early on whenever you come up face to face with any kind of situation? Do you go to him first? So he rose early, he gathered the officials of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls and seven rams, seven lambs, seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary and for Judah. This again, going above and beyond. They were only to bring one calf and one goat. So another heart check here. Do you go above and beyond? Are you at that point where you are so zealous that you are going above, going beyond, bringing more than you could to the Lord. And can you? I mean, some people just aren't even in a position to be able to offer more. They're at their wits end. It's okay. God God loves us no matter what part of our journey we're on. But it's just a time to look and say, hey, where am I now? Where do I want to be? Do I want to be the kind of person who's zealous and is above and beyond? Yeah, I do. Make it a goal. How can I do something today to get toward that goal, you know? God has been stretching me this week. I said it's a, been a week of stretching and I'm loving it because it is showing me that I am able to be zealous for the Lord and go above and beyond my own abilities. And it is amazing that when you get into that space and you're able to do that, that you really understand operating in his strength when you are weak. So it's kind of cool. So I, I would say hashtag goal <laughs> to be able to be zealous and to go above and beyond. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar of the Lord. So they did. They slaughtered the bulls and the priests received the blood and they threw it against the altar. And they slaughtered the rams and their blood was thrown against the altar and they slaughtered the lambs and their blood was thrown against the altar. And then the goats for the sin offering were brought to the king in the assembly. They laid their hands on them to transfer the sin to them and the priests slaughtered them and made a sin offering with their blood on the altar to make atonement for all of Israel. Don't forget that atonement is simply a covering of the sins and it is blood that is required for this atonement. Of course, Jesus being the ultimate atonement lamb, uh, he was the one who shed his blood so that our sins could be covered. 
And for the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all of Israel. And so they are needing to bring sacrifices and offerings. We don't do this anymore because that sacrificial system has been broken. Jesus fulfilled all of the law when he came and died on the cross. But we still bring offerings to the Lord by way of time, talent, and treasure. So heart check here. When is the last time that you offered a sacrifice? When is the last time that you actually gave something unto the Lord that you felt? An offering that you don't quite feel like it comes out of your surplus and it's easy to give, that's not technically a sacrifice. A sacrifice is something that is gonna hurt a little bit, but it's an act of faith and it's a beautiful thing. Not trying to make anybody feel guilty. It's just, again, heart check, you know? Like, where am I at? I wanna be this way, or maybe I don't, you know? It's just kind of taking inventory of our own spirits. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the commandment of David and Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet, for the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offerings be offered on the altar. And when the burnt offerings began, the song of the Lord began also, and the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. And the whole assembly worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded, and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. So the next step in restoring our temple is to repair our instruments. So again, getting in the word and then polishing our gifts. That's our instruments. The things that we can use for the glory of God are the gifts that he's given to you. Are we polishing our gifts on a daily? And then again, the offerings and the sacrifices come next, which is symbolic of our service to the Lord. Now they are worshiping in unity, which is so beautiful here that they are doing this, the whole assembly coming together to worship and worship will ultimately break barriers. It will create that unity. This is why it's so important for the fellowship to gather together. It transcends self. It gets your eyes off of you and focuses on God and it brings joy. Ultimately, check this out. When the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with him bowed themselves and worshiped. And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness and they bowed down and worshiped. So the fact that they were coming together in unity, that ultimately brought them joy. So they are now in the time of worshiping and rejoicing for what God has done. Then Hezekiah said, You've now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings. And all who were of willing heart brought burnt offerings. So the burnt offerings symbolized the total commitment in the sense that these offerings were optional. And these people who were willing to bring the burnt offerings were showing, hey, I am 100%. I am all in. I am committed. This was a joyful response. It was not out of obligation. They wanted to do this. So heart check. Are you totally committed? Are you willing to bring the burnt offerings, the ones that are going to hurt a little bit, but are you able to do it joyfully? Because that is going to be the evidence that this is a total commitment to God and not out of obligation. And so the number of burnt offerings was 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 lambs, all that these were for a burnt offering to the Lord. And the consecrated offerings were 600 bulls, 3,000 sheep, but the priests were too few and they could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until other priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. So this is really interesting here because we know that the law says that only priests can do these things and bring the offers, offerings and sacrifices, but now they're employing the Levites to help. And there's nothing in here that says that it angered the Lord. It appears as though God blesses the fact that they are actually honoring the spirit of the law in comparison to simply the letter of the law. They are now doing what is they believe is going to honor God, even though it steps outside of the boundaries of the law. So it's not legally right, but God blesses it anyway. 
Beside the great number of burnt offerings, there was the fat of the peace offerings, and there were the drink offerings for the burnt offerings, and thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored. And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had provided for the people and for the thing that came about suddenly. So there is essentially a revival going on. God did it. They rejoiced because they acknowledged God. So our acknowledgement of God and our rejoicing because of it is the evidence of our restoration in the end. So if we just look within our own selves and within our own lives, do we have the evidence of restoration? Do we acknowledge God in everything in our lives, in the good and the bad? And do we have a joyful spirit? Are we able to rejoice in the things that are going on in our lives? Chapter 30, we see this delayed Passover that is celebrated. So he's reinstating the Passover now. He restored the temple and now he's like, let's get back to the practices that once were. So Hezekiah sent to all of Israel and Judah, not just Judah, he's king over Judah, remember, but now he's going to all of Israel and Judah. Why? Because he remembers and he never lost sight of the fact that the covenant is not just with Judah, it is with all of Israel. It's with the 12 tribes and God's promises never change. And he knows this and he's going to make it right. So he wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. For the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had taken counsel to keep the Passover in the second month. So remember, Passover is usually in the first month, but that's already passed, so now they have to do it in the second month. So again, honoring the spirit of the law as opposed to just the letter of the law. For they could not keep it at that time because the priests had not consecrated themselves in sufficient number, nor had the people assembled in Jerusalem. And the plan seemed right to the king and all the assembly, so they decreed to make a proclamation throughout all of Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, that the people should come and keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel, at Jerusalem, for they had not kept it as often as prescribed. So they had not been doing the things of the Lord that their forefathers had done before them. So couriers went throughout all of Israel and Judah with letters from the king and his princes, as the king had commanded saying, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may turn again to the remnant of you who have escaped from the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not be like your fathers and your brothers who were faithless to the Lord God of their fathers, so that he made them a desolation as you see. Do not now be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and come to his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God, that his fierce anger may turn away from you. So he gives them a promise that if they repent and come back and do the things that they once did, that they would have one favor with their captors, because remember, they have been exiled all over the place. Two, they would be able to return to their land. And three, God essentially will never leave you. He will not forsake you. What grace that is that God is giving to the people who have turned their backs on him. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your children will find compassion with their captors and return to this land. For their Lord, your God, is in gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if you return to him. So the couriers went from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun to the northernmost part. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked them. So this is a tragedy of a response here. This is their own blindness that they're reacting out of to their own sin. They're like, we don't need this. However, there were some men of Asher, of Manasseh, and Zebulun who humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. So of course, there's always a remnant and a few of them did end up responding favorably. The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. So he gave them unity. And anywhere that there is unity, God will command a blessing. So this is going to show that there will be a blessing of God upon the remnant because of the unity that he gave to them. And many people came together in Jerusalem to keep the feast of unleavened bread in the second month, a very great assembly. And they set to work and removed the altars that were in Jerusalem and all the altars for burning incense they took away and threw into the brook Kidron. 
And they slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed so that they consecrated themselves and brought burnt offerings into the house of the Lord. So they are now cleansing themselves of idolatry, removing anything that might keep them from being able to celebrate this Passover. So now they have to prepare themselves for it, right? Because they're supposed to be clean. So they took their accustomed post according to the law of Moses, the man of God. The priests threw the blood that they received from the hand of the Levites, for there were many in the assembly who had not consecrated themselves. Now, they were not supposed to be able to partake in the Passover if they were not consecrated, but it is likely that they probably didn't know. I mean, it's been years and years and generations of them not celebrating the Passover, so they probably don't know what they're supposed to be doing. It's been a while. Therefore, the Levites had to slaughter the Passover land for everyone who was not clean to consecrate it to the Lord. And for a majority of the people, many of them from Ephraim, Manasseh, Issachar, and Zebulun had not cleansed themselves, yet they ate the Passover otherwise than prescribed. So they are doing it. They're stepping outside of the bounds of the law, and they are acting according to the spirit of it. For a majority of the people, many of them, uh, I said that, for Hezekiah had prayed for them, saying, May the good Lord pardon everyone who sets his heart to seek God, the Lord, the God of his fathers, even though not according to the sanctuary's rules and cleanness. So he is appealing to the fact that they are seeking his heart, not according to the rules and the legalities of what the law says. So he's like, Lord, please have mercy on them. I know that they're not doing things the right way, but their hearts are good. And that's the way we're supposed to be as the church. You know, there can be people who come into our church raggedy, full of sin. They look disheveled. They look like they just walked out of the worst of the worst of the pit of hell. But we are supposed to be people who do not reject the unclean especially if they are responding to a call of the Lord to come here and clean up their act. So we have got to have more grace and mercy upon people who show up at church. And the Lord heard Hezekiah and he healed the people. So there is his blessing upon the fact that they have done something maybe outside of the legalities, but their hearts were right and their hearts were seeking him. And the people of Israel who were present at Jerusalem kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness, and the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with all their might. And Hezekiah spoke encouragingly to all of the Levites who showed good skill in the service of the Lord. So they ate the food of the festival for seven days, sacrificing peace offerings and giving thanks to the Lord, the God of their fathers. Then the whole assembly agreed together to keep the feast for another seven days so they just did not want it to end because it was probably such a joyful time for them very different from what they had been experiencing so they kept it for another seven days with gladness and thankfully you know our moments of gladness with the lord they are not a one-time thing it's continual we have access to that unspeakable joy within us for Hezekiah, king of Judah, gave the assembly a thousand bulls, seven thousand sheep offerings, and the princes gave assembly a thousand bulls, ten thousand sheep, and the priests consecrated themselves in great numbers. The whole assembly of Judah and the priests and the Levites and the whole assembly that came out of Israel and the sojourners who came out of the land of Israel and the sojourners who lived in Judah all rejoiced. So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. So this is the greatest revival since King David. And worship, true worship, and true revival will always bring about freedom, it will bring joy, and it will bring gladness. Then the priests and the Levites arose and they blessed the people. This could have been the Numbers 6 blessing. And their voice was heard and their prayer came to this holy habitation in heaven. So Hezekiah has restored the temple. He has now reinstated the Passover. And now we are going to see him reestablish the organization of the priesthood. And this again, also not just a one-time event. Holiness is always going to be a result of a revival. A lot of the times we get that backwards. We think that, oh, we need to have a revival so that we can get people to be holy. But it's quite the opposite here according to the word. The revival happens first and then the holiness follows. So 
Holiness is result of a revival. It is not the reason for it. Now, when all of this was finished, all of Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the ashram and the broke down the high places and the altars throughout all of Judah and Benjamin and in Ephraim and Manasseh until they had destroyed them all. Then all of the people of Israel returned to their cities, every man to his possession. So this is all according to the grace of God that brought about this revival. And now when people are seeing the goodness of God, it is changing them. They are like, okay, you know what? We have seen God's goodness. We need to get it right. We need to start breaking down these altars, all of the things that are of filth. Let's get rid of them. And that's exactly what's happening. And Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and of the Levites division by division, each according to his service, the priests and the Levites for burnt offerings and peace offerings, to minister in the gates of the camp of the Lord, and to give thanks and praise. So they are now enthusiastically giving to support the ministry by which they were gaining from. You know, anytime we go to church, we get something from it. You know, you go to a Bible study, you get something from it. But are we just being taking, you know, a taker, taker, taker? I just want, want, want. You give, give, give. I deserve it. So you need to give it to me. Or do we have this heart like, oh, what can I bring to the table? How can I contribute? And this isn't necessarily speaking about money. It's just how are you able to contribute to your church or whatever ministry you are in? What can you give of yourself to give back? because they have obviously blessed your life. How are you now going to bless them, you know? So the contribution of the king from his own possessions was for the burnt offerings, the burnt offerings of the morning and evening and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, the new moons and the appointed feasts, as it is written in the law of the Lord. And he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and the Levites that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. So remember that this was kind of like their way of tithing. They would bring this to the priests and the Levites and this is what would support the priests this was their living this was their salary and where would they bring it well even for us when we uh, it speaks about tithing in the Bible where do you bring the tithe you bring it to the storehouse you bring it to the place where you are being ministered to to the church or wherever it is now this is a point of contention for people tithing uh, does Jesus ever command tithing Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he ever commands it. However, he speaks well of it. He speaks right and good things of tithing and encourages it, but he never commands it. Um, but Paul speaks a lot about giving and the way that giving should be. It should be something that is proportioned out. It should be something that is given, you know, in a timely way, like it should be continual and it should be given with a grateful heart. That's the most important thing. God doesn't need our gifts, but he wants our hearts. And so our heart posture is always going to be tested when it comes to giving, right? I mean, I know it every month that we, we write out our check or we send in the tithe. We look at the number and we're like, okay, Lord, here we go. You know, do what you will with it. And we never, uh, we never give our tithe and we never want to know what God does with it because the tithe belongs to God. It's not up to me about, you know, I, I cannot control what's going to happen with it. And I don't need to because I'm like, this is yours, Lord. This is not mine. So they are essentially doing that. And as soon as the command was spread abroad, the people of Israel gave in abundance the first fruits of the grain, wine, oil, honey, and all of the produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the people of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities of Judah also brought in the tithe of the cattle and sheep and the tithe of the dedicated things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God and laid them in heaps. Now in the third month, they began to pile up the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. In this crazy, it takes them four months to actually gather all of the offerings that were brought. Now when Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. And Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites about the heaps. And Azariah, the chief priest, who was of the house of Zadok, answered him and said, Since they began to bring the contributions into the house of the Lord, we have eaten and had enough and have had plenty left over. For the Lord has blessed his people so that we have this large amount left. So look what's happening here. God is blessing the people so that they can be a blessing. It's all cyclical. Like when we give, God returns that blessing. You know, he's not going to be a debtor to man. This is not a 
prosperity call where I say you give a thousand dollars God gives you back a thousand dollars it's not like that but God always rewards at some point in time the one who faithfully and joyfully gives of themselves and of their time and talent and treasure and I will say that in this year 200 days of giving anywhere from 8 to 12 hours of my day to the Lord because that's who I give it to it's to the Lord you know this is I'm doing it because he called me to that I've been doing it joyfully yes there are days that are challenging but this is always a joyful thing I never walk away from this feeling worse I always walk away from Bible study feeling better God replenishes what is given out. He always will. And I just love him for that. Like I am the most joyful that I've ever been in my whole life and the most content. And I believe it is because of the way that we are establishing ourselves on the solid rock of God and his word. Then Hezekiah commanded them to prepare chambers in the house of the Lord and they prepared them and they faithfully brought in the contributions, the tithes and the dedicated things. And the chief officer in charge of them was Konaniah the Levite, with Shimei, his brother, as second, while Jehiel, Azaziah, Nahath, Asahel, Jeremoth, Josabad, Eliel, Ismachiah, Ismachiah, Mahath, Benaiah. They were all overseers, assisting Konaniah and Shimei, his brother, by the appointment of Hezekiah, the king of Az Azariah, the chief of Shimei, his brother, by the appointment of Hezekiah, the king of Az Azariah the chief of the officer of the house of the God of God and Kor, the son of Imna, the Levite keeper of the East gate was over the free will offerings to God to apportion the contribution reserved for the Lord and the most holy offerings. So notice what's happening here. There is faithful administration in place. You know, he cannot take in all of these tithes and expect to be able to do with it, you know, especially in this abundance by himself. He needs people in place. We always are going to need a team and people and you know those who can surround us to help us out. Faithful administration. Notice how organized it is. God's not a God of disorder. I don't know where I am. I think I'm right here. <laughs> Eden, Meniamin, Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shechaniah were faithfully assisting him in the cities of the priests to distribute their portions to their brothers, old and young alike, by divisions, except those in role by genealogy males from three years old and upward all who entered the house of the lord as the duty of each day required for their service according to their offices by their division so notice how they are investing in the youth which is super important they are the next generation they are the ones who are going to be the face of the church we have got to be people who are investing in the next generation and of course, everybody here is of different generations. So whatever that means to you, are you investing in the generation after you? The enrollment of the priests was according to their father's houses, that of the Levites from 20 years old and upward was according to their offices by their divisions. They were enrolled with all their children, their wives, their sons, their daughters, the whole assembly, for they were faithful in keeping themselves holy. So these gifts that are being brought are actually supporting not only the priests, the Levites, but also their families. And for the sons of Aaron, the priests who were in the fields of the common land belonging to their cities, there were men in the several cities who were designated by the name of to distribute portions to every male according to the priests and to everyone among the Levites who was enrolled. Thus, this is always a good word. I'm like, okay, thank you. <laughs> so their generosity and their stewardship of the things that have been brought in, this is what happens. Thus, Hezekiah did throughout all of Judah and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord is God. And every work, every work, not some of it, everything he did that he undertook in the service of the house of God. So everything he put before the Lord and in accordance with the law and commandments, seeking his God, he did it with all his heart. And therefore, love the ending here, he prospered. So his generosity and the stewardship of the gift ended up blessing the life of Hezekiah to the point of prosperity. Why did he prosper though? Let's take it back. He was energetic in the way that he served. He was enthusiastic. And the word enthusiastic mean, is entheos in Greek. And that means full of God. He filled himself up with God. He did things wholeheartedly, never out of obligation. And he did it with zeal and diligence. And that is why God blessed him.
And here we are back in the Psalms again. We're at Psalm 48. I love it. We're going to end with a praise. That's always a good thing to end on. And this is centered around Zion, the city of our God. And they're essentially going to say, we got to praise him for his love for Jerusalem, his holy city. He has such care for the people of God, for the people that he has chosen and called and that today is us. You know, he has so much love for us and care for us. That in itself is enough to praise him. So great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, Jerusalem. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. So this is his why, is so that his holiness is the joy of the earth. It is for all people to see and to turn to him. The reason why his mountain was holy was because of the fact that his presence was in the temple there. So heart check, is God's presence in your temple? Is there evidence of the fact that God is present in your temple? And Mount Zion in the far north, which the northern part of Zion was actually where they were the most vulnerable because they were surrounded on both sides and to the south, but it was the north where Mount Zion was, and that is the place where they would have been attacked from. And so it just helps us to take inventory of where are we the most vulnerable? Where is our north? So that we know that we can be ready in that place and worship God in that place. That's what they did. Their holy mountain was in the north in the place that they were most vulnerable, and that's where they worshiped. And within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress, so he is their protector. For behold, the kings assembled. They came on together, and as soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, and they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, anguish as of a woman in labor. By the east wind you shattered the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so that we have seen. So we have heard the word of God of the past, and now we have seen it with our own eyes. In the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. So this is looking toward the final battle. We have thought on your steadfast love, O God. So when it says that we have thought on it, it means that we have compared it to everything else in this world. And guess what? Nothing can compare to the mercy of our God. In the midst of your temple, as your name, O God, so your praise reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with righteousness. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go around her. Number her towers. Consider well her ramparts. Go through her citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God, forever and ever, and he will guide us forever. So they end with this declaration that God will be with them forever, that there's nothing else in the world that will be able to guide them, to love them, to protect them, to show them that kind of steadfast love or mercy. And so when they're saying walk about Zion and go around her, they're saying, hey, you know, we just suffered a battle. We need to take inventory here. We need to go look around and see what is left. We need to look at the places that may have crumbled a little bit, see where our weak spots are. We need to see what's still standing and figure out what is left. Left and how we can learn from that. We can do that too after our battles, after times of trial, temptation, defeat, whatever it is. We can look to Mount Zion. We can look to the Lord and we can get those eyes, that eternal perspective on our own life. If we have that bird's eye view of our life and we can say, hey, you know what? I fell here. This was where I was weak. My wall and my defenses came down right there. I got to fix that. I've got to rebuild that wall. Or we can look over here and say, you know what? I was strong there. So maybe that is something that I can continue to pray over because we know that it is in those moments of strength where the enemy is going to come and attack you because you think that you are not vulnerable in those strong places. So I'm going to worship God in this place. But the best part about it is, is that when we take inventory of our surroundings, we can sit here and say, I'm still standing. I am still here. We can look back in the past of the arrows that we thought were coming over that wall and were headed straight toward us and say, it never hit me. The arrows of the enemy never destroyed me. That weapon didn't prosper. We can look at the things that we were once so consumed with worry and anxiety about and say, I'm still standing. Those things didn't destroy me. It didn't overtake me. Why? Because God was with me and he will still be with you in the next thing to come. And that in itself is enough to say, we praise you, God. 
Thank you so much for being our protector, for guiding us, for loving us, for surrounding us with your steadfast love and your grace. Lord, as we take inventory and look at our lives, God, will you show us those areas where we might be weak so we can access your strength in those places. Lord, will you show us where we may have been strong, where we can say, God, we need you there. We worship you. We thank you for those strong points in our lives, God. But will you protect them? Will you fortify those places in our lives so that we do not fall weak there ever? Thank you, Lord, for showing us how we can go through a complete restoration step by step, just the way that King Hezekiah did with the temple and the Passover. Lord, help us to remember that it is a continual thing and that it's not just a one-time event. But thank you, Lord, that you hold our hand through it the entire way and walk with us and never leave. We love you. We praise you. And we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I want to give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to go after I die. But I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer. I'm going to put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.